Thank you. I want to express my gratitude for bringing me here and uh, uh, being able to share my work with, with the, all of you here that have come to listen and um, uh, also to give me a little backstage tour of all the collections. That was a real treat. So um, um, I, I'm going to borrow this drum because <clears throat> I was given a song by um, one of my mentors. And so it's like a little welcome. I'll share a song with you. <clears throat> That song was given to me by Joe David. It is from the New Channel uh, tribe, which is the west coast of Vancouver Island. And um, he's become one of my most important mentors. And he's, uh, I'll, I'm going to get right into the presentation because I have him sort of folded into the, uh, the discussion. Um, so I, I grew up in Seattle, uh, outside of the Clinkett the community. Um, uh, the Space Needle is my homing beacon. I've, I've always lived in Seattle and never found a reason to leave. Everything that I was doing was um, happening in Seattle, the glass and also the music that um, I was playing when I was, well, actually I still play music, but the Kagwan Tan uh, is the, the, the house group that I come from. And when I was up in Sitka, I, I saw the Kagwan Tan own this street apparently. Um, so, and then my family always told us that we were descendants of Katlion, which is one of the famous chiefs uh, in the Sitka area. Um, so I finally found the Clinket Way um, <laughs> uh, through Seattle and my endeavors as a, as a glass artist. Um, so this is my great grandmother, the woman in the center. Um, she grew up, uh, she was uh, in our lives, you know, as in our, with our family. She lived in to be at least 100 years old. We're not sure if that's, she could remember how old she actually was, but we celebrated her 100th birthday in 1978. So we grew up with her in our family and in, in our lives, and she was a very proud uh, woman. Um, she was first married in, to a George Bartlett um, and it was a prearranged marriage, which was the custom at the time. Um, and, but uh, George Bartlett died in 1919, and then she remarried this Filipino man uh, named Dionisio Gubatayo, who uh, had ended up in Alaska for the fishing in the canneries. Um, and so this was who I knew as my great-grandfather, um, and I remember him well too, uh, but uh, the first husband my my uh, included my grandmother so my grandmother was still full-blooded clinket um, this is me and my son was quite a bit younger now he's almost 15 but uh, here we are some of the traditional um, regalia that I would wear in a ceremony um, this is some of my extended family uh, at an exhibition in Seattle my aunties and uncles and the two elders are from the, the, 
the, they're half Filipino, half Tlingit. Um, and my great aunt uh, there, she's still, still kicking, still alive. This is my father uh, doing what he likes to do best. Um, and my mother, uh, and I'm showing you these because my, my family, um, if I got any artistic or creative uh, impulses from them, they were always doing lots of different things. They were you know, playing music, singing old blues songs. My father was a great outdoorsman, would, you know, would climb mountains and go rock climbing and snow climbing. And, um, and he was always dabbling in all kinds of things, uh, soapstone carving and painting. And he wrote poetry and he was a very well-read man. Um, and uh, my mother was always doing lots of handicrafts. Um, and so I grew up feeling like, well, I could do anything I wanted. So I, I uh, dabbled in music as well as um, falling into glasswork. Um, this is my wife from Sweden. She, uh, we met on a work trip in 1993, and we're about ready to celebrate our 20th anniversary next week. So um, it's my kids, of course. Uh, but you know, growing up in uh, uh, in Seattle, there was always there was always a lot of music happening, and this was in the late '80s. Um, I was still having having dreams of being a rock star. That would have been my first chosen profession, but it didn't really uh, pan out for me, and so I fell back on my art career, um, <laughs> glass blowing. And of course, uh, for those of you who are not very familiar with it. It's a very team-oriented process. Um, there's a lot of effort, you know, making larger pieces. You need a lot of hands uh, to help uh, you make the larger pieces. Um, and so I, um, you know, uh, this is at the Museum of Glass, uh, working on a few pieces there. Um, but uh, I'm and so how I got into glass was through the introduction of Dante Marioni here. Um, and uh, we enjoyed a great relationship, friendship with uh, Lino Talia Pietro, who's the Italian master glass blower. Um, and he was coming to Pilchuck and the Seattle area quite frequently. And so we were very uh, studious of his efforts and, and tried to mimic his style. And of course, he's traveled all over the world now and taught lots of different people. Um, I'm going to launch right into a, a little bit of a story. I'm going to jump around a little bit. Um, and I, want, I, I show a lot of images because I think there's any art students here in the, in the audience. I, I, I like to kind of show a little bit of uh, context of how I became, how I kind of found my own voice uh, as an artist with the material of glass. Um, so we worked on a project in the summer of 2001 up at the school, um, and we made a totem pole for the, the, the school. And we wanted to uh, make a, a, this object that would tell the story of the school, and that's what totem poles actually do. They, they, they have a, each uh, you know, symbol in it or each figure has a particular connection to the story. And so that's, um, so you can see Dale Chihuly here. He's got the, the vision of glass, right? You know, and so instead of representing with a patch over his eye, we just kind of did this. So you can see this was a very cutting edge project that we did. Um, and it was uh, brought to, the idea came about with um, David Svensson here, who was one of my first um, mentors that I, I met up at the Pilchuck Glass School. The very first summer I was up there, um, it was 1988, and I was wanting to kind of, so I started blowing glass in 1982. I went to Pilchuck the first summer in 1984. By 88, I was trying to figure out what I could do to create my own, you know, kind of voice with the material. And uh, David saw me, you know, working with these Northwest Coast designs, and he asked about my interest in them, and, and I told him, well, it's part of my family background, and blah, blah, blah. And so then he shared with me his portfolio, which was full of Northwest Coast carvings. It was, uh, you know, totem poles, masks. He had spent several summers up in Alaska uh, working with Clinkett carvers, and he was trained uh, to understand the art form. And so this... Um, uh, so he brought this idea to the table, and I kind of pitched it to the school, and uh, this was to 
honor the founders of the school and also John Halberg, who was a passionate Northwest Coast art collector. He was um, the heir to Weyerhaeuser, the timber company in, in the Northwest, and he was also uh, donated the land to which, uh, which Pilchuck is situated. It's an old tree farm uh, about an hour north of Seattle. So we uh, came together. Uh, this uh, pole was carved up in Haines, Alaska with some of the uh, Clinket carvers up there and David Svensson. And then um, we, all, we sent it down to the campus and we uh, worked on it during the session and we created a, a class that, was, that surrounded the completion of the totem pole. And this is the one, the one thing that I did contribute to it other than uh, helping uh, with the class and helping the students work on casting. Um, uh, sand casting processes. Um, so this hat was, um, you know, everybody was making a big deal like, oh, where's, you know, how's the hat coming? Is that, you know, is, is it done? And, and, you know, after a while the carvers were like, yeah, next time you need a hat stand, give me a call, you know. It's just like, okay, okay, well, I understand. It was, you know, this, so, but for me this was kind of like a rite of passage, you know, the fact that my career was just coming up and I was able to uh, uh, be a part of this experience, um, it was really incredible. Um, there was one moment that you know the uh, some of the elders from uh, Alaska had come down from Klukwan, which is a traditional village up there, and they um, they were singing a song in the courtyard after dinner. You know, at Pilchuk, we have this dinner, and then we have a presentation, and then we all kind of get back to work. And came out onto the the courtyard, and they were singing some some Clinket songs, and I, and it hit me just like. And it hasn't happened since, and it was a long time since it had happened at that point, but it was this distinct feeling of deja vu, like I'd been there before. So I was, um, it was, you know, for me it was just incredible to be uh, working on these, these uh, uh, on this project. This is a double-headed killer whale dagger that was uh, repatriated by John Halbert to a family up in Angoon. And so as a result, he was adopted and given the Clinket name. So that was, and you know, he had also donated his collection, much of which, which was um, Clinket and Haida material and Simshan, but it was, uh, uh, it was donated to the Seattle Art Museum. So he was really celebrated, and so we, we saw it fit to, uh, to honor him with the totem pole, seeing as he even had a Clinket name. So as a, you know, as a, during the session, uh, we, you know, everybody who wanted to work on the poll, you know, uh, uh, did. Um, we, as a community, we kind of came together and, and uh, here we're carrying it to its installation spot. Whoops, out of order there. Um, so here we're putting the hat on the, on the totem pole. Um, but it actually protects the end grain of the pole quite well, so I think I should start a business with that but um, so there it is uh, completed you know uh, just a little bit of the, so the bottom figure is is John Halberg he's shown wearing a, um, a wolf headdress which his name was Gooch Kiates means uh, dark wolf um, and he's shown holding a tina as a copper form which is denotes the high status of an individual and it has this dagger so we asked permission from the Jacob family in Angoon if we could uh, make a copy of that, which was the correct protocol, you know, for that situation. Um, then we have Dale Chihuly in the center with the curly hair and the eye and uh, holding the wings of this raven with the, 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 the sun in its mouth. And, you know, it's sort of like Dale Chihuly brought the idea of Pilchuck to the world, so his raven brought the light to the world. And then Annie Halberg is up on top. She was uh, John's wife, so she's... Uh, you know, the women are always on the top, right? Um, so, I, you know, I, I like to think about this as a, um, the more that I uh, get into this process and when I place myself on this path is the genetic memory, you know, kind of coming, uh, coming out. And the more I delved into it, the deeper um, connection I felt with it, and, you know, since I wasn't raised with any religious instruction, some of the uh, background of the influences and the feelings that I had about it was, you know, reading Carlos Castaneda in high school was a big thing to do. And, 
I always wondered about the idea of this lucid dreaming where you could navigate within your dream time. And so it, it just opened up a whole lot of um, ideas for me. And then, of course, Jung. Um, uh, and, you know, I didn't go to school, uh, to college for uh, beyond high school. And so I was left to read about things that interested me. And one thing was the dream analysis, which I have come to realize that Jung had um, uh, studied a lot of the, the Native American vision quests and things like that, and that the, for Native people, that you know any casual occurrence um, can have significant meaning. So um, those are just some of the things that really kind of helped me uh, discover um, uh, you know what it is that I do today. The other thing that I did, which I think is interesting, because of all of these diverse influences, you know, Aikido was another. It was a martial art that I uh, practiced for several years. And um, a friend of mine introduced me to it. And he said, so, so what, did you, what did you get from, you know, from Aikido? And there's this moment where you're working with a stick. And you're, and you're fighting with the stick. And you're working on this. this it's, it was a form of moving meditation. Um, and for, for me, the stick was, became like the glass blowing pipe. And, you know, when you're working with Aikido, you're actually working with an opposing force. And with glass, you're also moving with this material. So it, it was, for me, it was really, it was really, it made sense. Whereas, you know, the, my friend was like, well, what did you think about like all this, you know, sitting quietly and bowing in and all this stuff. And he, I just wanted to get around and start throwing people around. And I said, well, no, for me, it was, it was really, after a while, I started moving differently with, with the, the blowpipe. I, you know, move with my, from my center. And so it was really um, a very cool thing that really opened a lot of, um, and it's very deeply rooted in Buddhist, you know, uh, Zen um, philosophies. And so that was something that really added to all, everything that I, that I do in the way that I think about things. Um, and in the summer of 2000, this is the year before I, we did the totem pole, I met this guy, Joe David, um, who, um, uh, be, you know, he, he basically wanted, he said that he would be, um, would love, so he was an uh, artist in residence at Pilchuck, and so I was his artist assistant. And he said, well, I'll, I'll go there, but I want to build a ceremonial sweat lodge up on the campus. And I, and I said, well, we can try. We'll ask them if they, you know, if they would allow that. And they, sure enough, they did. And so, um, and uh, he told us that it was going to be a suffering and sacrifice ceremony. Those who were interested come and talk to him. And after a few minutes of like talk, telling us what we need to know and looking into our eyes, you know, we would, he would let us know if we were, you know, ready for this. And I, I was really nervous. I had never done a sweat before. Um, I didn't know. And, and yeah, everybody was like, well, it's suffering and sacrifice. What is he going to do to us up on the hillside? You know? And so, um, but so in 11, and, and as the day was getting closer, we were going to do this ceremony. I said, Joe, look into my eyes. You know, tell me, you think I'm ready to do this? And he goes, well, let me put it this way. You better be. <laughs> and, you know, but, but after that, that session, he ended up um, a, uh, giving me a name, which on the Northwest Coast is something that, you, that can occur and it, note, it denotes a change within your life. Like you can, you know, be given a name if you're going to become the leader of a house group, or and it's an ancestral name. So the name that he gave me was Kakao and Chief, which means transforming killer whale, and it was it's an artist name. So he's become, you know, he really opened my eyes to the native spirituality um, and the sweat lodge ceremony, which I can only equate as, you know, personal growth is something that. Uh, uh, they're not recruiting people to be part of this spiritual thing, but it's like if it happens to you, then great. Um, and so um, it's one of the pieces that we um, uh, made together while uh, he was up at Pilchuck, this crystal wolf skull. Um, and of course, at Pilchuck, you're playing with all kinds of weird techniques that you just never would even think could be uh, possible, you know, pouring hot glass into wood, you know. So, uh, so this is a piece that I made that kind of commemorates that um, a teacher and apprentice, um, and is the, the supernatural white wolves that um, transformed into killer whales here. 
And um, so that's one piece. But when I first started, so now I'm getting back, uh, now we've gotten past that. Uh, the first things that I, you know, as a glass blower, I had to look at um, uh, things and try to imagine, well, how would I do this in glass? And the first thing that I came up with was this hat form, which I would sandblast these designs into the glass. <clears throat> and so I got a little sh short little crash course in sandblasting. And um, the very first piece that I ever made um, ended up in the Anchorage Art Museum, but I, I had, had a, we, we used to have a little holiday open house at the studio that I worked at at Benjamin Moore's studio, and my aunt um, was really excited that I was starting to get into this, uh, the Northwest Coast art, and, and so she, you know, we as the assistants would usually have a little card table over in the corner, and Benjamin had these beautiful pedestals with his light coming down, and my aunt said, well, can we take the hat over and put it over on the pedestal with a nice light? And he said, yeah, sure. So we took Benjamin's piece down and I put mine up on the pedestal and when he wasn't looking. And, and, he, uh, and, and about 10 people had sort of followed just to see what was going to happen and all these shadows came through and everybody was like, oh, look at that. The, the, well, yeah, that's what I intended all along, you know. I mean, <laughs> Yeah, of course. So that, I mean, for me, it was like the eureka moment. It's that was something that I, I realized, um, I came to feel is that it was kind of a, uh, a spirit within the glass that is revealed when the lighting conditions are right. So, um, you know, and it's to me, it's kind of like a kinetic sculpture in a way. You know, where the light passes through it, and if you have it in the sun, you know, on a table, then it casts these really beautiful abstract shadows across the table. So. Um, that was kind of the secret behind those pieces. But so looking at traditional objects, I would try to, you know, replicate them in different ways or be inspired by the traditional objects. So this is a pretty broad range of, 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 of you know, time frame that as my skills evolved, I was able to create um, these effects and mimic the traditional objects with the glass with the design work and everything and the, and the techniques that are used to, um, to, uh, to make them. And, and so a lot of these objects, they do represent, um, you know, ancestral connections. And this is a killer whale, which is my, my uh, crest symbol. Um, and so there is almost everything that you find on the Northwest Coast is, is <coughs> is decorated with something and it's usually uh, pertains to um, you know your family symbolism so there's a sort of a, um, this is like a, a war helmet and then so I take it and I I take that form and I do kind of my own inspired version of that type of thing and the rattles are um, traditionally uh, shaman's rattles you know, these, this is actually became more known as a chief's rattle, a, the raven rattle. Um, but, you know, these tongues that are connected and these animals that are emerging out of people's mouths, they talk, talk about the transformation or the, the, uh, the transmission of the, uh, the natural world to human beings and back and forth. So, um, uh, so again, Playing with uh, so this was a freeform sculpted uh, bubble that I just poked and pushed and blew and labored over it. So it um, so now the 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 techniques that I'm using are quite sculptural and and they're still blown glass, but they are um, utilizing different techniques. And this is a, a shaman's um, amulet, is a soul catcher. So let's, here's my version of it. And I like playing with these kinds of themes because it, again, it harkens back to the spirituality of the community, you know, and it, and it, and it symbolizes that. That's what it symbolizes to me. Um, um, so today, what I'm doing a little bit more is I'm getting deeper into the stories and the mythologies that, um, uh, these stories that are handed down through the generations and Raven in the Box of Daylight. And this is, um, uh, 
an exhibition that I'm going to be working on uh, for 2017 at the Museum of Glass. And so um, taking that story, I'll, I'll, I would, I'm going to make a kind of an installation, a narrative kind of an installation that as you walk through the gallery or you walk through the museum, each object will tell a bit of the story. And so I'll try to uh, give you an abbreviated version of that. So this is, this is Raven um, you know, with the sun. And um, so Raven was walking around in the, in the beginning of time and the world was in darkness. And he went to the fishermen of the night and he asked, you know, where's the light? And uh, the, uh, uh, the fisherman said there was this old man that had this, these things in his clan house. And they told him of his, the, the old man's daughter who uh, goes to the, this stream every morning and drinks uh, water. So he goes up to the clan house um, and tries to get in. The old man shoes him away. Um, and um, so Raven transforms himself into a little speck of dirt and uh, the daughter's out there in the morning and she start, goes to drink the, the water and the, the attendants, her, her attendants see that there's dirt in the water so they, they cast it out. Um, uh, so Raven has to reformulate his plan and he transforms himself into a hemlock needle and the second time, you know, the next morning, she scoops him up and she doesn't notice it. So they swall she swallows this hemlock needle and then Raven is inside of her and, and she becomes pregnant. And so um, the, um, uh, you know, she becomes pregnant and then uh, she uh, gives birth to Raven in the form of a human child. But this... Um, this child is very precocious and he's really, you know, shifty and, and even the, the old ladies in the community are like, he's got raven's eyes. Um, and so um, the old man, you know, he doesn't mind. He's happy to have a grandson. Um, and so Raven is scouting throughout the, the, the house and he discovers a box. And so he has to play with the box and the old man puts the box in front of him and he plays with it for a little while and when nobody's looking he opens up the box and it's the box that contains the stars. And so he takes the stars and casts them through the smoke hole in the in the clan house and that's how the stars got into the sky. A couple of days later, you know, he sees the next box and he has to play with the box and the old man puts the box down and um, and uh, he uh, it's the box that contains the moon. And so, of course, what happens when nobody's looking, he places the moon in the sky. Um, and th this is kind of a quick version because I have a lot more to show you. But these stories can be very, very elaborate with lots of details um, within them. That, uh, and then, you know, the symbolism, I'm going to try to get into it as well. Um, so the final box is the, the box that become, is the sun. The, uh, this boy is tired of being human, so he transforms him back into a raven, himself back into a raven, and he takes the sun and he places it into the night sky. Um, and with the flash of light, um, uh, some of the people, they run, uh, they jump into the water and they become the sea animals. Um, some of them take off into the sky and they become the birds. Um, and uh, some of them run off to the forest and they become the, the forest animals. And the people that remained where they were became the human beings of the Tlingit. Um, and most indigenous names of tribes uh, the, the actually translate to human beings. So literally the Tlingit means the human, human beings. Um, and so... Um, and so that's one theory where why, you know, that started to adopt these crests of these animals to represent the families. So this is the, um, the eagle representation. This is a, the uh, raven. Um, and these are done, these are glass prints. These are water jet cut flat glass and then they're fused back together um, and then shown kind of like a print. Um, and uh, so there's the killer whale, the crest symbol. 
So here's some more examples of um, the different techniques that I've employed to create uh, Northwest Coast objects. These are baskets, of course. <clears throat> the eagle, eagle hat. They're kind of inspired by a, a grease dish. Um, boxes were really prevalent on the Northwest Coast, storage boxes. Um, and so as my skills evolved, uh, I was able to create more and more different effects with uh, um, the techniques and create different um, um, kinds of objects. <clears throat> the, a comb form, a little bit of details. It, it's really, you know, it's hard to to see these pieces um, on the screen is one thing, but it, when you see them in person, it has a very different effect. So this is kind of a little explore a couple of the details of the piece and how I'm able to get um, the uh, the design work into the glass. And this is all done with the sandblasting process, which involves putting a rubber tape on the surface of the glass and then drawing the design onto the glass, cutting it out with an X-Acto blade, exposing the areas that I want to be have carved. And so at one point, this was all sort of a beige brown color. And the stencil creates the lines and you sandblast everything away that's exposed. And then that's how you get the design onto the glass. <clears throat> And these are uh, sculpted figures with these cast glass faces. Um, more detail shots. <laughs> um, and you know, since so since I didn't go to art school, I um, I was left to look at stuff that interested me. And, and I looked at the modern the modernist artists, you know, and they there was this. Um, uh, a quote that I read by a native scholar named Renard Strickland who said it was ironic that the modernists forced us to appreciate the primitive uh, and uh, uh, also to appreciate differing levels of reality. And you know, I think you know, the students that are here might know that there is this movement called primitivism, which the modern artists were looking at objects from you know, the Native America, uh, from Africa, from oceanic cultures, and then making things that kind of, you know, looked a lot like that. I mean, so it gets to the, the, the question of, you know, were they appropriating, you know, certain kinds of styles? You know, here you've got Picasso with a, with a um, African uh, helmet there, sculpture. And so I decided that I would do a little of that exploration of my own and I look at kind of the modernists and and try to make work that was um, you know these spare organic forms that kind of referenced uh, the modernist art so I have my modernist fish um, and then there's a eagle raven so the top portion of the beak is the the eagle and then the bottom uh, angle is, is the raven with the more of the straight beak and then they share an eye. So I'm playing with more abstractions now um, and sometimes they pertain to stories and sometimes they don't. Uh, this is the, um, the origin of mosquitoes. So you've got the mosquitoes biting through this guy here. Um, and again, you know, kind of playing with the idea of making my own amulet kinds of forms, this type of Thing. And then uh, the man in the moon. Um, this is a, to me, represents a feather. Um, and then again, just playing with these spare organic forms and, and putting Northwest Coast uh, details on them. This is a, a mussel shell. And as I call this one, the invocator of hidden spirits. It's got the, the land otter and the octopus on it. Um, and then again playing, you know, kind of an abstraction of a killer whale. Um, but, you know, 
for, so for me to, to, to uh, uh, as a glass blower, I really had to um, be a quick study on, on how to create these designs onto the glass and to make it look like Northwest Coast. I was always, you know, had this um, drive to make it look as authentic as I could, even though I'm using this new material, um, um, uh, you know, glass. But to me, I feel like it brings another dimension to indigenous art, um, you know, with this, uh, uh, the way that the glass inter interplays with the, um, the material. Um, so I started going to these indigenous artist gatherings, which um, were by invitation. We went to Hawaii um, and we, you know, so typically we're about, I don't know, about a hundred artists, all from different media, uh, mediums and disciplines. And so here we are in Hawaii, you know, blowing glass. We had the, a little portable glass blowing furnace. And so I got to share with some of the people there how how I work and so I was also witnessing you know the things that they do this is a Pacific Islander here um, working on a piece of, uh, of wood um, and journey to Aotearoa it was um, the Maori uh, the indigenous people of New Zealand um, so this is a piece that I I did to kind of commemorate that journey um, and, and you know, it was just incredible. So I've been to about three of these gatherings now, and they're always very profound in, in you know, the, uh, you know, sharing our culture. And so here they're trying to teach me how to be a, a Maori warrior. And that was about uh, the, I, I don't know, I, my fierce look <laughs> wasn't, wasn't as quite convincing. Uh, but you know, these people are really incredible. And the fact that they are um, kind of unified as a group, um, their culture is really intact. So it's inspiring for me to go down there and see that, of course, you know, they're one culture and, uh, and two islands. And of course, they have the clan connections and their clan disputes and all of that. But they're really incredibly uh, uh, amazing people and their artwork is, is just uh, stunning. And I got really into the idea of um, the mokos, the, the, their, their tattooing. So I, I, I asked them, I said, I, you know, now we started this friendship, you know, what could, I don't want to be culturally inappropriate, but what could you give me as a, as a moko? I, I think it's really uh, beautiful. And they said, I said something to do with the sun or, you know, fire or something, because I'm a glass blower. And they and I said, oh, yeah, that'd be easy. It should be ruao mokos, the the god of volcano and earthquakes. And so I said, yeah, that sounds good, you know, because we always think of the glass as the, the lava, you know, we're working the hot lava. And uh, so I, I went ahead with the, that design and I was showing it off, you know, I said, so hey, what was this guy's name again? Ru, uh, Ruel Moko, he's, yeah, he was a god. Yeah, he was a god, right? He's like, yeah, he's a god. He's kind of a mama's boy. <laughs> yeah, he's always trying to, shake the earth or he's going to blow up a mountain and his mom's always trying to calm him down. I'm like, no. Okay, I mean, that's, but that's uh, indigenous humor for you. you, know, you got, um, so a little bit about collaborations. Um, you know, I've, I've been working collaboratively with several different indigenous people, um, sort of bringing them over into the glass uh, world. And this was uh, Maori jade carver named Lewis Gardner, and this was their uh, whale writer. You're probably familiar with that, but you know, in, the, in Alaska we have our own whale writer as well as um, um, uh, the the man who created the killer whale. And so we were looking at different stories that might have similarities that between our two cultures, and um, and then of course combining the material of the jade. So the green is the jade. And this is like a canoe prow, and of course, in the Northwest Coast, we have canoe uh, traveling people as well. Um, this is the salmon mother myth, and this is the, um, so these pieces of jade are quite large, you know, they're, uh, so that's the one thing that he's doing is, uh, Lewis is, uh, you know, pushing the scale, the limitation. Um, 
a gallery that I was working with in Santa Fe asked me about, well, you know, we collaborated with all these native artists. What about Dante Marioni? What would you do? You know, how would you guys collaborate? You know, they started to represent Dante's work and they wanted to uh, just challenge us to see what we would come up with. So these are some of the things that we did. Some of the first things that we did, I was thinking of um, basket forms, you know, with Dante's um, sort of masterful, uh, uh, cane work that he does in his own work, uh, we came up with this series of pieces and played with lots of different kinds of um, effects. Um, Tammy Garcia was um, is is a Santa Clara Pueblo potter, and I was really at attracted to her work because um, of the classical forms, and that was some of my foundation uh, as a as a glass blower. I was working with people who. Um, wanted to make these perfectly blown glass forms. And so I, um, I encouraged her to, to work with me and it really actually did help cross the material over um, into, into the Native American art collectors' minds. Uh, prior to that, I mean, I think the anthrop you know, some anthropologists would like to keep it neatly contained within a little, I call it like a cultural corral you know, this is how it was done, this is the traditional material, and that stuff doesn't belong here. But this, to me, kind of shows that we are living cultures and we are working with new materials. Um, who's to say that we shouldn't be able to experiment with uh, new mediums? Of course, Joe David is, uh, uh, and I have done a lot of work together. This is a, called this a, a Thunderbird egg. Um, and then a, a giant bracelet, which just becomes a canvas for the design work. Um, and then these headdresses, um, and then using the cedar bark as the hair, which is more tradition with the wood carving. Um, and then working guys with guys like this, Buffalo Man, um, who I like to call as the original Native American glass artist because he um, uh, works with beads. He's a bead worker. Um, and that's what I always like to point out is that glass has a defining historical connection to native culture and it came through beads in the first place. Um, and these beads were adopted and, and or, you know, used as ornamentation for clothing and ceremonial um, objects. And so um, anyway, this, this is uh, Marcus's culture. So if I delve into another cultural style, I always do it with somebody else. I don't appropriate someone else's, else's cultural style. Um, and so this is from the mound builder culture from the Southern uh, American, uh, South, Southern America. Um, and it looks a lot like, you know, uh, Aztec or, or Mayan, you know, kinds of dec decorations. Um, um, and uh, so anyway, that was fun. Um, and then some of the monumental works that I'm doing. This is a piece I did for the Seattle Art Museum. Of course, the boxes are quite large in their scale and have a lot of presence to them. This is the piece that went to the Corning Museum. It was the first box I actually ever made. I called it Never Twice the Same. Because um, a lot of these, um, you know, sometimes these, these things are decorated, but they're not they don't have a particular meaning. You know, it's hard to put meaning into every act. People are always asking, well, what does this little detail mean? Well, it just look good, I thought. You know, so I, I mean, it's hard to create a masterpiece that has like all of this, but you know, this, this design style becomes a bit like calligraphy in a way. You know, you, there's a fluidity to the design and there's rules and regulations to the, the architecture of the design and how it all works together. So. It's fun to play with that because you can really create infinite varieties of, of designs. And so all of these are, are, are um, original designs that I put together. Um, this is a full-scale canoe paddle. Um, this is a really technically challenging piece to cast. This cast glass. This was the clan house piece. This is a little bit larger screen than the, the first one I showed you. This was for the Museum of Glass. And the one that I'm working on for the Sobolev Center um, uh, for the Alaskan um, P-51 
piece is 12 feet by 9 feet high. It's the biggest one I've ever done. Um, sometimes I go back to Dave's coffee shop, uh, my, my friend David Svensson. And um, so I wanted to create a piece that was, um, I wanted to do a cast glass totem pole because I thought I should be the first one to do it because of, anyway. Um, and so since I'm not a wood carver, I did a collaboration with David, who, um, you know, doesn't do this for a living or, or um, well, in, unless he's doing it for me. Now he's sort of my ghost carver, I call him. Um, he, uh, uh, so anyway, he has this ability, but he doesn't, you know, it's hard to um, uh, put yourself out there as a, as a non-native Northwest Coast carver. Um, though people do do that. So this is a uh, story uh, of my great grandmother who had a pet grizzly bear as a child. Um, and so there was uh, some uh, family that was hunting and they ended up shooting the, the mother bear, this grizzly bear, it was, you know, it was her or them and so they shot it. And they noticed that these little cubs were, you know, wandering around so they grabbed one and they brought it back to the village and so my great grandmother she raised it as a pet and um, so that was a time when there was a lot of Russians in Sitka and so what she would do um, this bear had a taste for this taffy there was this Russian woman that would sell her taffy on the streets and you know carry it around in a basket or something so my great grandmother would go out and pick berries and bring them back and she would sell the berries so she could get Russian money to buy taffy for her, her little, her pet. And until it got to be too big to keep around the house. And then of course they ended up, I, the story goes that uh, someone took it and put it in a zoo somewhere. So that's what happened to the, happened to the little guy. Um, and uh, that's out of, out of uh, so, so here is the, uh, the, the totem. It's like, it's about 2,000 pounds of glass, um, and it sits in a high-rise apartment in Chicago. Um, so my accomplishments are not my own, but those are many. I, I, you know, the, these are the these are the people that help me uh, do my work. These are my um, uh, my team that helped me in my studio. We're packed up to move into a bigger studio here, but um, I thought it was a nice shot, but. That, that saying for me also um, speaks to um, the, the lineage that I'm a part of. I mean, I'm the guy that's doing this now. Um, I'm hoping that if, if I'm successful with my own work that I would inspire you know, another generation to do something in their own way, the way that I've kind of found out how to work with glass because the materials that we work with are becoming increasingly rare, like the, the big logs for the cedar totems and the, and the dugout canoes and what have you. So the needs of the people um, will be reflected in new materials, I'm convinced, in the future. And it could be steel, it could be concrete, it could be you know, stone, you know, who, who knows what the next um, step will be. But to keep those stories alive is... Um, you know, that's, that's going to be the next step, I think. Um, so this is the studio that I moved into. I have a little hot shop, glass blowing studio. Um, and here's a little bit about the sandblasting. So that green that you see is the rubber tape. That's how we cut out the stencil. And when I'm doing the basket forms, this is how I, uh, we lay the tape on the surface and then we sandblast against this thin vinyl tape. And that creates the, the patterning that, um, that is, uh, happens in the sandblaster. And so what I really wanted to get to is my music. <laughs> um, start to feel like that, you know, those actors that are like, yeah, I'm, a, I'm an actor, but you haven't heard my band. You've got to come out and hear my band. Um, so this is, I, I call it a Native American funk band uh, because that's the style of music that I like because it, embodies the best of, uh, you know, uh, jazz and rock and soul and dance and even gospel music. So um, that's the, um, the style of music, but it's also kind of a, a 
performance art group. You know, we are uh, we have storytellers and, and actors, and you know, so we come out with Northwest Coast uh, regalia and and um, um, you know do elements of spoken word, and and it's really uh, different. Um, it's not exactly, but it all it does have this kind of soul blues kind of style styling behind it. And we did we did release um, a CD. It's available on iTunes um, or through my website, littlebigband.com. Um, so anyway, we we put this together. It's after about um, seven years. <laughs> this is our this is our token white guy. Um, most of the musicians are are are. Um, are Native American, um, and or African American, and so this is James Luna, who's a uh, performance artist out of uh, San Diego, um, and then so this is the new project that um, I'm working on. I was going to play a little snippet of the music to kind of show you what we're doing. This is Bernie Worrell, who is um, a keyboard player for Parliament Funkadelic. I don't know if you know, some of you might know who that is, but. Um, Bootsy Collins, and anyway, so he was, he, uh, I uh, paid into a Kickstarter program to, um, to uh, play my 50th birthday, and um, he said he would drive that van out and uh, that tour bus that I was helping him buy and play a, a show for me, um, and then the next night he would do a public show, and I said, "Well, I have a band," and um, said, "Well, yeah, you should, you should open up for my band, you know." And, and I said, "Well, I'll, I'll check and see if we're available." Uh, um, uh, and so, sure enough, we did the show. And then, as we were parting ways, he said, "You know, I, I've been thinking about your music, and I got some ideas. We've got to work on some stuff." And so, um, uh, I. Uh, so this is a little bit of the the style and it'll have, this is a work in progress. This has uh, native voices that are also um, part of it. is called Kuiks, which means potlatch in Clinkin. And potlatch to me is a, a sharing of culture and stories and, and dancing and music. And it's kind of a, a ceremonial Clinkin thing. spoken word stuff as well. And that's it. Okay. 